four, three. Hello and welcome to the Interdigital Innovation Challenge video chat. This is a portion of our final round when we get to know our contestants a bit better and find out about their proposals. Today we are speaking with members of the team called Signet Ring and they include Tam Vu and Ashwin Ashok of Rutgers University Wind Lab. And the way this will break down today is we'll have a five minute presentation from the team members and then that will be followed by 10 minutes of questions from those of us at the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology, Cali T2 at UC San Diego. And then we'll be joined from We'll be joined by some of our participants in the chat portion, who could include judges from the interdigital competition, um, as well as some representatives from interdigital. So, without further ado, let's get started. We'd like to hear from you, Signet Ring, about your proposal. Thank you, Tiffany, for uh, introducing. So, uh, hello, this is uh, Tempo, and along with me is Aswin Nassel from uh, WinLab, Rutgers University. So we are here to present our proposal called uh, Signet Ring, distinguishing users and uh, devices using uh, capacitive touch communication. So um, I guess many of you uh, have heard of uh, the story of a kid that accidentally spent $1,400 uh, of uh, his uh, mom's credit card when, when he uh, playing a game in his, in his mom's phone. So uh, this could uh, have been avoided if the phone was able to identify uh, that the kid is interacting with the phone instead of the uh, instead of the parent is interacting with the phone, so that um, the phone is actually uh, can uh, unauthorize the transaction that the kid made. But unfortunately, those are uh, not available in today's technology, and uh, current identification and uh, authentication methods are uh, cumbersome. Uh, so this screen is very familiar with all of us. When, whenever we want to use our phone, we have to identify ourselves to the to the phone, like authenticate ourselves, type in the password. And more often than not, we if we don't really carefully type it in, it will we will get this message wrong password. And uh, so this the main reason for this is because uh, typing in password is was borrowed uh, a type of authentication that was borrowed from old days of of desktop where like typing in is easily with your keyboard, but now it's it's it become less and less convenient where why we move to forward to um, uh, mobile uh, uh, computing and mobile devices, and also it even be become more um, inconvenient where um, in the today's people tend to switch rather quickly from one device to another. Say you when you are outdoor, you carry the phone with you. And uh, when you get indoor, when you get into your office, you switch to your laptop quickly. And, and when you go to meeting, maybe you switch to your tablet because the battery of the tablet is probably less longer. Or on the way go, or when you get to the car going home, you have to open your car uh, using the key. And you might unlock the dashboard because sometimes you enable the, the try proof uh, authentication. So with all that, it's uh, the authentication method that currently we have is, is cumbersome. If you have to type in password so many times per day, why don't we find uh, one, another way of, of, of authenticating? And we, um, as a um, student doing in research, we were looking at the uh, question of what could be a more intuitive way of identification and uh, authentication. So uh, we, was, we motivated our, our proposal, our uh, technique, by the fact that the capacitive, capacitive uh, touch sensing become more and more pervasive. You can see a uh, mobile device uh, touch screen in mobile devices, or even in ATM machines or home appliance like a TV or even a microwave. And also, uh, those devices are tend to be used by multiple users. Multi many people are at the same time at the same time are sharing those devices, like in the multi-user game uh, scenario where many people want to share the same tablet. Uh, so we uh, wanted to uh, associate users' identifier to the touch that they make on the screen. But unfortunately, with today's uh, off-the-shelf devices, those sensors wasn't made to be uh, for that purpose. Uh, so because of that, we introduced an, a, a new, a novel form of wireless communication that we term capacitive touch communication that include a hardware token that carry a bit sequence. And that bit sequence gets transmitted to the touch to the device 
through their touch screen without any modification to the um, hardware component uh, of the of the device itself. That being said, it's uh, it's harder to do that, but it's uh, we. We, we offer that harder path because we, we think that this approach without any modification to the device will, will uh, fast will, will get adopted by the, by um, easier. So uh, let me tell a little bit more about the capacity touch communication. So we have we look at the problem as a as a traditional communication uh, uh, system where we have a, a, the transmitter. That, uh, which is a hardware token that generates electrical pulse. So this electrical pulse is um, modulated in the, so that it can carry a bit sequence. And when the electrical, uh, when this um, token in uh, proximity with the um, um, mobile devices or any device that enable with the touch screen, it will register touch events uh, on uh, those devices. And uh, those touch events will later be decoded by a software component residing inside those devices. So, for example, when we want to transmit a bit sequence of 10110, for example, we, the, the, the electrical pulse that generated will be in the form um, uh, like we shown here in the figure that when we want to send a bit one, the uh, token will start uh, generating electrical pulse. When we want to transmit bit zero, the token will keep silent. So it's essentially just a just a simple uh, on-off key mechanism here. And those signals will generate touch event and register those touch event into the device. And um, those touch event in turn will be um, decoded by the, the software component inside the device. And uh, as we show here, it's, it will get uh, the, uh, the original um, bit sequence being transmitted is decoded. So um, we've been um, working on this for over a year, and uh, we will successfully prototype uh, the, and, and prove the feasibility of the idea. So uh, just last month, we uh, present and show the demo in Mobisys conference, which is uh, one of the premier conference in mobile computing. And it was uh, the idea was very well received by both uh, um, academic and, and industry uh, people. Uh, so I'm uh, looking forward in the in the near term uh, as a near term plan for the next two months. We want um, we um, are targeting two applications. One is we want to enable multi uh, uh, gamer a uh, multiplayer game where we want to provide a wearable token as a module for a gadget uh, makers or game maker to integrate uh, this into their um, their product as well as we can we can sell separately or we can make the product separately and sell it to the consumer to um, to enhance their gaming experience and uh, uh, since the market uh, the, uh, the mobile gaming market is is quite large this time and it's about 10 billion uh, in the dollar market and in US alone it's about 100 million dollars so I think um, we, if we can get into this market, it's um, um, it's a, it's a good um, it's it could be a good start for us. And also another um, application that we are targeting to is provide hardware and software package for uh, parental control uh, customers uh, and end user. So you know, that will require a small hardware token and uh, uh, application that people uh, that the user can download just from the app store. Um, looking uh, even uh, for, for the longer term, we wanted to penetrate to uh, device authentication market at um, uh, vehicular security, home security, where uh, in those with those markets it would require um, higher level of security, so uh, and uh, require more bit being transmitted and, and other mechanisms that that in, uh, raise the bar for you know, for security. So that's why we think that it should take longer. Um, uh, over time, and uh, we also uh, want to change the way that people now paying. So instead of using credit card, we want to introduce a, a notion of credit ring, where instead of typing your card number, which is 16 card, 16 number, it's not very easy to remember. And uh, instead of doing type type those in, you can just touch the ring onto the screen, any of the any of the touch screen and all device, and your information should be transmitted, and it's just easy like that. And also, um, we think that medical security is also a, a potential market. And um, furthermore, we wanted to uh, uh, change the way that um, SIM card or, or wireless devices are being managed now. Uh, so now, typically, all the um, all devices are in, uh, um, uh, embedded with uh, a SIM card that help the, the courier provider uh, can uh, tracking and revealing for those devices. But uh, as 
uh, we see the trend that people are switching from one device to another and many people sharing the same device, we think that it would make sense if people have a portable SIM card that's embedded into their ring. And uh, so that will change the way that uh, that wireless um, the device is being managed. Also, looking further, if we can uh, you know, make the design of the, of the uh, hardware better and we can convince the, or the uh, um, jeweler or, or fashion companies, then we can even put this as further thoughts for uh, technology jewelry. So, um, so the most recent news that we, we received was that our technical paper was uh, accepted to the uh, Mobicon, which is another premier uh, conference in mobile com uh, computing community, and uh, um, it's proved that our idea was very well received in um, in academic community. So uh, with that, we we um, very eager to look forward to push our idea toward the market and uh, and um, so that we can get a, a, a larger adoption. So okay, thank you for that. So let's thank move you. on to a few questions then. And congratulations on you having your paper accepted. Um, Thank you. So, as far as the next milestones that necessary for developing and commercializing your technology, what would you say those milestones are? And do you require additional expertise, say, in the areas of marketing or analysis? Um, I'll take up this uh, question on Mashwin Ashok. Uh, well, definitely, we need a lot of. Uh, we have a few milestones to cover even before we completely penetrate in the market and. Uh, even the very first uh, applications, multi-user gaming that we want, multi-user gaming parental control, which we want to um, release out into the market, uh, which basically the milestones would be to improve the num num uh, increase the number of bits that we transmit. Uh, right now, it's in the order of four to five bits, and we have been testing the reliability with uh, in the order of eight to nine bits, um, and we want to improve the reliability. So that's some testing which we which has been going on for months. Um, and we are very confident we are going to improve over there, but that's the major milestone we want to cover up. And once improving this number of bits, uh, we certainly feel that um, these applications can definitely be put as products into the market. Um, that's one major. Um, while testing will be keep going on, uh, as and when we want to uh, improve the number, uh, we want to expand into a number of applications. Um, a great input from a community like interdigital and various other industries would be in the form of marketing. Um, we have students, uh, uh, we know how this uh, markets into the academic community, how will, what kind of research could be done, but uh, in terms of skills for marketing and the business perspective and what the market size is currently, we definitely could get a lot of uh, help in that uh, in terms of skills and designer as, as well, uh, put the packaging into it in a neat form and getting a smaller small pack, uh, form factor for these um, device, uh, products would be uh, very much needed. So a designer is something you're also looking for. Okay. You mentioned that you'd like to improve the efficiency of your product. Is that your your product's greatest weakness at the moment or what would you say is your, is your innovation's greatest weakness? Uh, yeah, I would definitely agree that we have not reached 10% level of uh, reliability right now, but we still feel that the 90-92% that we have achieved right now is impeding us to really strongly put it into the market, and we definitely want to make sure we reach very close to the 10% level um, for our satisfaction and making sure that's a very strong product that goes into the, goes into the market. We feel that uh, improve, increasing the number of bits um, and the and hence the reliability along with that uh, would be the major, um, would be the weakness at, at this point. Um, but we feel that can be, uh, uh, that will be addressed very soon. Okay. I think I'll move on to some questions from our chat participants. And among them we have Naresh Soni, who is the Chief Technology Officer of InterDigital and also one of the competition judges. Okay. Another judge joining us is Kali T2, director of the UCSB division, Ramesh Rao, who is uh, a judge, as I mentioned. And uh, we also have Richard Cho joining us from Inner Digital. And I believe that Mr. Cho is a systems engineer. Am I wrong about that? Principal engineer, excuse me. So we'll take a question, the first question from Naresh Soni, and I should mention to you that these questions will appear in the chat box, but I will read them aloud as well. And Naresh's question is, 
what is your innovation? Oh, sorry. What is the cost of the wearable device? So, um, so the raw cost of the wearable device is really cheap because, as I as I mentioned in the in the uh, in the previous slides, that uh, it only have a has a function generator. That uh, it's a basically a programmable um, microcontroller that. Uh, it's cost like about less than a dollar if you buy it in a large uh, quantity. It could be fifty cents, and so I think in, in total the price is less than one dollar. So it's uh, it's really cheap. But we the cost when it go to the consumer, it it might be add up all the designing and 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 other like and and packaging and all. Okay. Moving on to our second question from Ramesh Rao. How do you prevent the device from being cloned for unauthorized use? And again, that question will appear in the chat window. Uh, so uh, the de device, it's, so I, we, first of all, we believe that if you carry the, the ring with you, uh, it, it's, it's unlikely that you will give your ring to someone else. So in order to clone the, the, um, uh, the, the the signal or the ID that the ring, uh, the device carry, it's um, you must have um, the possession provide. You must have the device, and you try to um, somehow copy the signal that it generates. But uh, uh, I would like to add a point to what Dan said, and um, just to remind you, maybe from the design that you've showed, uh, this wearable ring has two major components. One is basically the function generator part of it which generates those bits and one is basically the microcontroller which actually has um, the ID in it and um, oh, which is actually detachable um, and we say that this, uh, this is actually a reconfigurable wearable device where uh, maybe one person in the household could have the whole ring um, without the token and people could even purchase that token separately which means basically you're owning your own ID by yourself. Um, in terms of cloning, um, I will, I mean, it's basically stealing your, it's like stealing your uh, token from you, but that's something you cannot avoid with respect to stealing. And in terms of cloning, um, it's basically you have to reinvent that whatever microcontroller and know what kind of ID it, it is there. And that's for, as long as you don't share um, uh, the ID in that way, like you share your password with your wife or someone. Um, okay. The question. Okay. If, if there are follow-up questions, we can have those appear in the video chat box. I have one question, actually. As someone who is the victim of having lost a wedding ring in the past, um, how will you mitigate loss of rings? Will you have a way of giving users the ability to find the ring if they do take it off, to say to wash their hands and lose it? Uh, yeah, I think you're relating to uh, uh, you're yeah, alluding to the fact that uh, you just can get lost. Definitely, you cannot avoid the fact that uh, any hardware device, like anything, can get lost. Um, but there, uh, we don't. Yeah, I accept that we don't have this feasibility where you can go track the ring or something. Like you can try go track your iPhone or something. That's some feature. Um, but definitely, that doesn't limit us from adding some features like having a set of IDs which uh, we provide or the user chooses and have a feature where you could go track those IDs, uh, which point, uh, where are those IDs currently. Um, yeah, okay. You're probably able to track it. But at this point, I don't think we have enabled that feature or we have not uh, thought too much into it. So we, ex we hope that a person who owns this ring is careful enough to uh, keep it safe. And since it's electronic, please do not wash your hands along with that. <laughs> <laughs> Fair but enough. Okay. It's good. We need to package it very well. Um, definitely. Okay. And another question here from Mr. Cho at Interdigital. Um, this is a question. It has to be a low power de device. So, what is your plan for making it as efficient as possible? So, uh, with respect to the power, um, we uh, when we designed this, there's two options for us to uh, to to build the hardware token. One is uh, we could have it continuously transmitting the signal uh, or transmitting the ID. But another option, which is up for, um, which is more um, secure and it saves more energy, is that we uh, have a small switch on the surface of the ring. So only when the ring in contact with the with the um, with the screen of the device 
it will start transmitting. And again, this signal is really, um, it, the review cycle is, is really low. It's only when you touch, it will start, and otherwise it will go into the standby mode. So it, um, I, we did some calculation, and we think that it's, uh, uh, it will take like in order of 10 to 100 years to burn out one the small coin battery. OK, a second question for Mr. Cho is, how do you activate the circuit? How does the ring detect the touch? Uh, I'm sorry, how, how, how the Can you repeat the question? It appears um, in the chat box. Uh, how do you activate the circuit, or how does the ring detect the touch? So, um, so, as I, as I, so I think the, the, my previous answer was also part of uh, the partially answer the question, which was like, how do you, how do we activate the ring, right? Just, uh, we have a, uh, there's, there's many ways of having the switch. It could be either the many uh, mechanical switch, as I mentioned, that when you touch the ring, uh, touch the ring to the screen, it was uh, activate the circuit. Another way could be when you, when the ring in, um, if we, we can have a photo detector embedded on the, on the surface of the ring, when the ring in uh, close or in the proximity with the, with the tablet or with the, with the device, it will detect the light from, from the, from the um, uh, device and it will, it will activate. And uh, with, so about how the ring detect the, uh, the touch, I think... I think um, other reason. Uh, with, actually, the ring doesn't really need to detect the touch or... I mean, so let's um, hope we are making it clear over right. here. Um, so the ring is basically a transmitter over here. So uh, as Sam mentioned, you could have an extra, uh, the user could be triggering it with a switch. Say I have the ring with me, I press a switch, and it's transmitting those bits um, sequentially. Um, it is basically the touch screen device, the touch screen of the touch screen device that detects this um, Touch and touch technically is basically uh, whenever the ring is in very close proximity to the screen, it's detected as a touch event. That's why we said just spoofing these touch events on these screens. And uh, we run a software component. So there are two modules to it. One is a hardware ring, and second is a software component which runs on a device. So we have an application which would keep running um, uh, underneath the touch screen of this device, and you'll have an external ring where you just press the button uh, to uh, communicate with the touch screen. So that's what you meant. Hope oh, that's what you meant by your question. Okay, we'll we'll clarify if we need to. And let's bring up the third question from Mr. Cho in the chat box, which is, how would you program this device? Is it one-time programmable or user reprogrammable? It's a user reprogrammable. As I said, it's a microcontroller and very easy. Uh, I believe uh, these these chips are uh, readily available from uh, Texas Instruments. I believe uh, very easy programmable. Um, it doesn't need it's not rocket science over there. Uh, but definitely, as a user, you for a user end user with no knowledge of programming and programming kind of microcontroller, something is just taking it out and getting another reprogrammable uh, reprogrammed uh, token from us who, who are the sellers basically. Uh, and your answer, yes, it is reprogrammed. Okay. And then uh, another question from Mr. Sony. I believe you might have answered this in your previous reply, but how does the user change the code in a wearable device, and can someone capture or steal the signature? Well, yeah, I think the, the previous answer will probably answer this uh, question also, that uh, yes, we can, uh, if, the, if, you, if the user wants to change the, the code, they can just, so the way that we do currently is just we plug the chip into the uh, through the USB interface to, with the computer and we reprogram the chip. So the code can be changed and, uh, because we um, the hardware device uh, the hardware token would have a memory that stores the code inside. We can programmable and it's programmable. Okay, we have five minutes remaining, so a few more questions here. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the other submissions to the competition, but if you have. What would you say makes your submission idea stand out from all of the others? So first of all, uh, as we have been already campaigning for it, uh, it uh, we stand on this uh, idea of extremely novel form of communication. 
uh, this is something which has not been looked at uh, anywhere. You don't have a product that does the same thing that uh, we are talking about. Uh, there's no capacitive touch. Uh, screens are so pervasive, but capacitive touch sensing has not been really explored, um, even in the research community. Um, so we as a research community coming up with a new idea along with a prototype is something we uh, we don't see uh, a lot at least in the other submissions. Maybe they do have their own prototypes, but um, not sure how much marketable it is and um, what are the pitfalls. But definitely we stand out in terms of uh, where we are. We have a prototype which we think and we already have a plan in place um, for the next few months and a few years ahead also. For this product, which makes, uh, which shows us we are pretty serious about pushing this into the market, and we already have our plans laid out. It's all about just doing it and implementing it. Okay, we have another question from Dr. Rao, which will appear in the chat box. The question is: Your use of the term signet ring is very suggestive. Are you thinking of combining elements of biometrics to create a ring that only comes alive when the authorized user wears it? Uh, that's a very good point, um, and uh, definitely we have been we have thought about this, and we have lot of, we had a lot of discussions about it. First of all, um, we stand apart from biometrics. We say that this is an alternative solution here because biometrics are not really um, a very robust. Uh, I mean, not very reliable. Of course, you can anyone could wear a fingerprint mask these days, which they already show in movies. Um, and retina scans are really, really uh, painful. You have to uh, really align yourself with the camera. Uh, so the main thing is making the user really, uh, making it very end user um, friendly and making it as easy as it is. Just take your ring and touch it on the screen. But as you mentioned, um, combining elements from other levels of authentication, other levels which exist today, definitely adds a lot of improvement in the product. Um, marketing sense as well as its own performance, um, it adds to the multi-level area of multi-level security, multi-level authentication that you can think of. You can think of having this ring, having a password, having a fingerprint uh, scanner along with you. Um, but that's not necessarily a requirement. But add add-ons to this technology will definitely help it. Not necessarily detrimental. I just want to add a, a small point that we do look at uh, how do you uh, actually how, how do you uh, realize that it's actually the owner wearing the ring by we look at the uh, purse biometric purse of the of the user but we don't really have a, a solid result or, or any proof at uh, at this point but that's a really uh, a great idea. Okay, and this will likely be our last question. Given, uh, assuming that your product makes it to the market and is developed and, and becomes successful, how, how do you see it changing the face of this technology in five to ten years? So I think uh, Sam's slide, the very, the very last slide, um, pretty much answers this question. Uh, basically, we have a long-term vision of different applications over different timelines, and um, at each level, you can see there's actually an add-on in terms of lot. Of um, what the product actually does, as you, from the level of device authentication, where at a minimum level of security is at least required. Um, when you go to vehicular, you need more security, and home even more. Um, and in terms of uh, using uh, these ATMs, uh, touch screens, and uh, payment-based methods for these touch screens, and using this technology, there would require to convince these touch screen manufacturers to adopt that technology. Um, same thing with medical security comments, this hospital personnel and the medical equipment manufacturers, um, then uh, mobile phone manufacturers um, for our portable SIM card idea. So there's a lot of convincing to do in terms of business uh, prospects as well as the research. Uh, there's also an incremental value in the research. Uh, so we already uh, see there's a plan laid out and uh, as and when time progresses, uh, we uh, we hope to just solve these milestones, break these milestones, and get a product out every now and then. And we certainly feel that capacitive touch coming sensing and some communication is a technology which may not fall out at all. Um, it's a very promising idea. Uh, we are very confident about it. And what application you choose at the right time, uh, it definitely has to be very judicious. Um, and we hope to get a lot of inputs regarding that over time. Uh, 
but I think we have a plan laid out. Hope that answers okay. your question. Thank you. So if there are no other questions from our chat participants, that will conclude the video chat with Signet Ring. Thank you for letting us know more details about your very interesting project. And we hope to learn more about it as the competition continues. We wish you luck. And thank you very much for participating. Thank you, Disney, and thanks all the panelists and attendees. Thank you. You're welcome. Goodbye.